There are three carbohydrate myths that really need to be addressed before we can progress in getting our best possible bodies and our best possible minds. Let's break them down. After this video, I want you to check out True Kava. Okay, I'm really into kava oil lately, okay? Look, I don't drink, so I still like to have that sort of social relaxed feeling, and that's what kava is all about. And True Kava is a very interesting kava in that it's third-party tested, very, very pure. So you can add it to your coffee when you make a keto coffee in the morning, or personally, I like to use it at night to help take the edge off. It boosts a lot of the neurotransmitters. So we're talking about uh, dopamine, serotonin, uh, gamma aminobutyric acid. So you get a pretty calm, relaxed feeling. True Kava is a very stable, full spectrum kava. So it's not like the really inexpensive kind of cruddy kavas that are out there on the internet. It is a very high quality form. So you're making sure that you're getting exactly what you need in a kava. So it's sort of like a non-addictive alternative to alcohol or some of these other things that people might use to be mood altering. Again, it's called True Kava, and the link is down below. So there are a couple different ways that you can use it. Add it to coffee, use it earlier in the day, or in the evening time if you wanna take the edge off, if you wanna just feel a little bit more social without anything that's really mind altering. So make sure you check them out down below in the description after this video. Myth number one, carbs are to blame for the obesity epidemic. Okay, we have to address something here. Carbohydrates in excess, in abundance, when we're constantly consuming them, definitely play a tremendous role with this. But when you look at the ketogenic diet, you have to understand that a large part of why a lower carb or ketogenic diet works so well is because we're removing so much of the processed hyperpalatable garbage that we're consuming. Now, that being said, there's additional benefits of keto. Trust me, I lost 100 pounds utilizing it and kept it off for 10 years with it. So I'm not saying it's anti-keto here. I'm just trying to open up the whole can of worms so we can look at the big picture. When we look at insulin resistance, it's easy to think that carbs are automatically the enemy, okay? But the reality is there is a pretty serious heated debate within the scientific community about which came first. Did insulin resistance lead to obesity or does obesity actually lead to insulin resistance? And there's very strong arguments on each side because with the inflammation that's associated with obesity, that could absolutely trigger some insulin resistance. But insulin resistance could also trigger obesity in a lot of ways. Well, there's a very, very recent study published March 12th, 2021, like just released. And it was published in the JAMA and it was a meta-analysis of 60 studies, okay? And they concluded with this meta-analysis that insulin resistance does indeed come first before obesity or weight gain. This is really intriguing when you look at the big picture because now we're like, okay, well, this just confirms it. Carbohydrates are leading the problem. Well, carbohydrates do spike insulin, but remember, there are other things that also affect our insulin levels. And I would make the personal argument that it's not so much about the food we are consuming and about the consistency of how much we are eating. We never take breaks from eating. We're always elevating our insulin levels. And those high levels of insulin that are just chronically high and chronically even moderately high, that could be a bigger contributing factor than carbohydrates per se. There was a randomized control study published in Nutrition Research that took a look at adding buckwheat into the diet, okay? So buckwheat is super carbohydrate dense. We're talking 71 grams of carbs per 100 grams. That's more than white bread, okay? So when adding buckwheat into the diet for four weeks, there was a significant reduction in fasting glucose levels. That's pretty wild. And then there was another study that took a look at sweet potatoes in rodent models and found that just adding sweet potatoes in had a huge effect on fasting glucose levels. So it's not necessarily carbohydrates spiking our insulin that are the problem. It's the consistent elevation of insulin. Now, that being said, the ketogenic diet is different because the ketogenic diet not only eliminates the carbohydrates, which is definitely a big problem, but it also has the addition of ketone bodies, which have their own mechanism of helping things. Ketones help with insulin sensitivity on their own, independent of the fact that we are eliminating carbohydrates. But we have to get it all out on the open here that carbohydrates aren't necessarily the enemy of obesity. Now we move into myth number two, which is a really deep one that's very important to me. And that is that all fructose gets converted into fat. I am guilty of fear-mongering a little bit with fructose because I personally am a little bit afraid of overdoing the fructose. I think we overconsume it as a whole just with high fructose corn syrup and what have you. 
But what's interesting is fructose does indeed get converted into fat much easier, but we have to explain the mechanism, okay? We do know that fructose decreases mitochondrial biogenesis, so it basically makes our mitochondria less efficient. We do know that it increases visceral fat based on multiple studies. Okay, we do know that it decreases insulin sensitivity based on multiple studies. Okay, but let's look a little bit deeper. What's really funny is there is a study that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, took a look at only 42 of 3,331 known fructose studies. So it cherry picked, no pun intended, 42 out of over 3,300 studies. And they concluded with these 42 studies, hey, it's safe to have 90 grams of fructose per day. Well, guess what? They found out who funded that study, Danisco, the largest fructose manufacturer. Well, what do you know? So a bunch of researchers came out and they're like, wait a minute, no, we see what's going on here. And most researchers came back and said, no, between 25 and 40 grams per day is really where you want to be on the upper end. And I fully agree with that. If you're not doing keto, that's a perfect number to aim for. That's a modest amount of fruit. That's perfect. But what's the problem with fructose and fruit? It's called de novo lipogenesis. Okay, de novo lipogenesis literally means new fat. And it's been known that the liver converts fructose into fat significantly easier. But let's take a look a little bit more because there are things called labeled studies. Okay, the deal with fructose is fructose has an additional proton within the carbon core, meaning that when you test the breath, you can measure how much fructose has been oxidized. So there's specific studies that look at fructose oxidation. One study in particular published in Nutrition and Metabolism, okay, this is the one that we're really questioning here, said, hey, we noticed that when we measured the exhaled breath of people that consumed fructose, less than 1% of it ended up as plasma triglycerides, meaning less than 1% of the fructose actually converted to fat. Mind you, that's still more than regular glucose. So fructose is still in the doghouse, okay? But only 1%, that makes me not so afraid to have an apple. But then when you look at some of the other research, you realize that they measured this six hours after ingestion. A lot of the studies that look at fructose and de novo lipogenesis find that there is a delayed release of the fat from the liver by up to 24 hours. So what that means is when we consume excess fructose, it gets converted into triglycerides, into fat, but it hangs out in the hepatocytes in the liver for a while. And then it gets released into the bloodstream up to 24 hours later. So unless we are consistently measuring between six and 24 hours, we really can't say that 1% is gonna get converted into fat when we know that most of it gets released later on. Point is, is you should be limiting fructose, but you shouldn't be afraid of it. Okay, fructose has some benefits, Fructose gets converted into glucose, so it actually doesn't have a huge insulin response. So you can have a few carbs and actually have less of a negative effect on a lower carb diet if you keep it within reason. Anyway, this brings me into myth number three. Okay, myth number three is that high glycemic carbs are worse than low glycemic carbs. Okay, this one is a little bit frustrating because again, it's not necessarily how high we spike our insulin, it's how we're consistently spiking our insulin. And you could make the argument that having a lower glycemic carbohydrate that keeps your insulin levels high and stable is actually worse than having big spikes and then coming down, big spike and then coming down. There was a study that was again published in JAMA that took a look at five weeks of low glycemic carbohydrate intervention where they swapped out foods for low glycemic carbs and they saw no change in biomarkers, no change in cholesterol, no change in glucose. So what's going on here? Like, okay, well, the point is, is that again, it comes down to these chronically high levels that are just stable but high. That seems to be the problem. We're also not accounting for fructose. Remember, as I mentioned when I was talking about fructose, that a good portion of fructose gets converted into glucose. So if you look at say table sugar, for instance, which is half fructose, well, you're not factoring in the fact that, well, that fructose is going to take a lot longer to metabolize. So even though there's a relatively high GI, the fructose itself is bringing that GI down. Okay, so we don't always factor that. There's a lot of variables. It's like saying, okay, I'm gonna have 100 grams of watermelon, which is relatively high glycemic, compared to 100 grams of potato, right? It's just different. There could be similar glycemic index, but the load is different overall. Another piece we have to look at is literally our microbiome and how we individually process carbohydrates. I might have a different signaling process and different microbiome that is gonna metabolize carbohydrates slower or faster than you, which indicates that the GI could be a completely irrelevant thing when it comes down to what our body actually perceives from it. 
So we can't just lean into this high glycemic versus low glycemic thing. It all comes down to moderation and it comes down to being able to specifically have set meals. So I always suggest when people are trying to change their body, have clear defined meals, stop blurring the lines in between your meals and allow your body to have times where insulin goes down so you remain insulin sensitive. So you're not constantly even at a moderately low level of insulin. I'd rather you be very low than moderately high, very low, moderately high, rather than just snacking constantly, never letting insulin levels come down. So to wrap it all back up again, myth number one, carbohydrates are responsible for the obesity epidemic. Myth number two, all fructose gets converted into fat. And myth number three, high glycemic carbs are worse than low glycemic carbs. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you tomorrow.